I love you, Lord, for your mercy never failed me in all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God, yeah. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after. It's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God oh I will sing of the goodness of God. Well, welcome once again. Uh, today is uh, Sunday morning, I hope, and <laughs> you're gathered together with your family. And uh, we're going to look at point number six of our message that we begin Wednesday. The title of the message was A Time like none other. And uh, according to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21, 
Uh, Jesus said, For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world, until this time no nor ever shall be. So we're talking about the tribulation, uh, those days of horror, those seven uh, years that will tick off the clock uh, when God deals with His precious people, the Jews. Thus far, we've talked about the prophecy of the tribulation, and we looked at Matthew, we looked at the book of Joel, and we saw that uh, uh, this prophecy tells us that these days will be days of deception and darkness and death. We talked about the period of the tribulation. We looked at Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. And of course, Daniel chapter 9 is that prophecy where Daniel is told that his people are going to pass through a period of 490 years. And we talked about that prophecy and how the last seven years, 483 of those years have ticked off the clock, seven more years of Jewish history to to take place, and those will take place during the days of tribulation, seven years. And those seven years are divided into two periods of three and a half and three and a half. The last three and a half of those years are called the time of Jacob's trouble, where the persecution will be greatly intensified upon uh, God's precious people as they all of a sudden realize uh, that this one that they thought was their Savior uh, is actually a sinister individual who will bring ultimate doom and chaos. So we talked about the prophecy of the tribulation, the period of the tribulation, seven years. We talked about the placement of the tribulation. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it uh, answers the question, when? When? Well, the tribulation will take place after the turning from the truth, the apostasia, the arrival of the Antichrist, when the Antichrist is revealed and the word reveal there is the word apocalypsis, from which you get our word apocalypse. It means to be unveiled. And also after the removal of the restrainer. And the restrainer, I believe, is the church empowered by the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, certainly when the uh, church is, is raptured off the scene, uh, all, all hell will be unleashed on this earth. Also we talked about the purpose of the tribulation. God has purpose. God just doesn't arbitrarily do something, but he has great purpose in what he does. And I told you to learn this truth. God never brings pain without purpose. And the greater the pain, the greater the purpose. And the purpose of the tribulation is to redeem his covenant people, the Jews. And the Bible does tell us that uh, all Israel will be saved. So the purpose of the tribulation. And then the preachers of the tribulation, we talked about how during the tribulation, uh, there'll be great revival. Not before, but during uh, the tribulation, there'll be incredible revival. And there'll be two preaching uh, sources, the 144,000 Jews of Revelation 7, and they are literal Jews. You know, many people say, well, this is me, and, and this is uh, the Gentile church. No, no, my friend. <laughs> These are the 144,000 Jews. Uh, uh, Jewish people who will, who will begin to evangelize. And then also the two witnesses of Revelation 11 who will give their testimony, who will speak their word until their task is finished, and then they'll be overcome by the Antichrist. God will uh, take them into heaven after they've lain in the street dead for three and a half days. And after people have rejoiced and exchanged gifts over the celebration of their death, uh, happy dead prophet day. And... Uh, so those are the things we've looked at thus far. And I want to save an, an entire segment of time to talk to you about point number six. And it's interesting it's point number six because uh, six is a number of man. Uh, he was created on the sixth day. And of course, 666 is man in place of God. And I, I think you know something about that. But this is point number six. And we're beginning uh, to launch out in some new material as we talk about the prince of the tribulation the prince of the tribulation. Now, we don't know who he will be, but we do know what he will be. Uh, there are over a hundred passages that describe the Antichrist, and yet the word Antichrist is used only four times in four verses, and only by the Apostle John. Uh, he uses these in, um, in 1 John and also 2 John, and John is the only one who uses the term Antichrist. Paul uh, calls him the lawless one, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Actually, there are more than 25 titles 
uh, given to the Antichrist. Uh, he's called by Daniel a fierce king, a master of intrigue, the prince who is to come, a despicable man. Uh, Zechariah calls him a worthless shepherd, and John the Apostle again later in the book of Revelation uh, refers to the Antichrist as the beast. And even though his identity is not revealed, uh, that has not stopped a lot of speculation. If you, if you Google who is the Antichrist, you'll get almost 15 million hits. Uh, now folks, if you ever reach the point where you know who the Antichrist is, guess what? Uh, you've been left behind. Uh, you're in the middle of the tribulation. You've been left behind. Um, so uh, who will he be? Who will he be? Well, we don't know who he will be, but we do know what he will be. Let me give you uh, 12 uh, traits of, of this one that the Bible refers to as the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the lawless one, uh, uh, the worthless shepherd. Twelve traits. Number one, number one, he will be a master of miracles. He'll be a master of miracles. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures, so if, if you can, turn with me. I've marked most of these, so I'll get there before you do. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, The coming of the lawless one, and that's what Paul calls the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So he'll be a master of miracles. In Revelation 13, you read the same thing. Folks, please hear me. Listen, listen. The miracles are never, never, never a validation of authenticity. I, I pray that you understand that. I pray you take that to heart. Miracles are never an indication that that person who is doing the miracle is real, is authentic. And I remember years and years ago, a man down in Florida, and he was one of these who claimed to be a healer. And he had a big banner behind him saying, no man can do these things except God be with him. Well, that's not true, folks. That is absolutely not true. And today we have people that flock to the latest person who, who waves a sweaty handkerchief and, and knocks somebody down and they say, oh, they must be of God. No, no not necessarily. Because we read about the Antichrist, the lawless one, the son of perdition, will be able to do signs and wonders and have great, great power. So number one, uh, the Antichrist will be a master of miracles, a master of miracles and wonders and signs. Also, he'll be granted his greatness. He'll be granted his greatness. In Revelation 13 and in verse 5, it says of the Antichrist, And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and was given authority to continue for 42 months. If you skip down to verse 7, it says it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And all authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Uh, notice the phrase, was given, was given, was granted, was granted. God is allowing his rulership. God is allowing his rulership. Don't ever, ever, ever think that Satan has conquered God and has overcome uh, the Lord, not in any way. God is allowing him this, this reign, this rule, for this period of seven years to do these things. God is using him just like he used uh, the Assyrians, just like he used the Babylonians, uh, just like he used the house of Pharaoh to raise Moses. God is using him for his own purposes. So uh, he was granted his, his greatness, and greatness there is in is in quotation uh, marks. Also, he will be the apex of arrogance. The Antichrist will be the apex of arrogance. In Revelation 13 and uh, verse number 5, it says, And he was given a mouth speaking uh, great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to conquer for 42 months. Also, if you go to Daniel, uh, turn to the Old Testament book of Daniel chapter 11, and in Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, it says, Then the king, talking about the Antichrist, shall do according to his own will. 
He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished, for what has been determined shall be done. So, of all the attributes of the Antichrist, this one seems to be the most repeated. Uh, Daniel says that he will magnify himself above every god. You know, folks, this is nothing new among uh, egomaniacs. Uh, there, there are so many out there who have an exalted opinion of themselves, so many leaders and rulers. Napoleon uh, had a coin minted with his image on the front as emperor, and on the back of the coin it shows him presenting the law to a kneeling peasant. So Napoleon was saying, look at me, I'm, I'm the lawgiver like God or like Moses. Uh, Hitler, and if ever there was a forerunner, of the Antichrist, it, it was Hitler. Uh, Hitler, listen to some of the things that Hitler said. These are quotes from Hitler, Adolf Hitler. Quote, in driving out the Jews, I remind myself of Jesus in the temple. Now how about that? How about that for an egomaniac? He, he said this also, just like Christ, I have a duty to my people. And also he said this, he said, what Christ began." I will complete. So Hitler uh, made claims of being, of being Christ. And what a, uh, what a cruel uh, individual, what a devil in human flesh Adolf Hitler was. Uh, folks, listen, humility is a trait of Christ and His people. And when one boasts and brags, he, he's just emulating the character uh, of Satan himself, of the Antichrist. So he'll be the apex of arrogance. Also, he'll be the slaughterer of the saints. He'll be the slaughterer of the saints. I want you to see this in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, and in verse number 25, notice what God's Word says about the Antichrist. It says, He shall speak pompous words. There we have it again, his arrogance. Against the Most High shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law, and then the saints will be given into his hands for a time and times and a half times. It's three and a half years, by the way. But notice the word persecute there in verse 25. You see the word persecute? It may be translated in your Bible, and should be translated in your Bible, wear out. It's literally the word wear out, like the wearing out of a garment until it's threadbare. And the idea is of a slow, painful, cruel, torturous persecution, much like that during Nero's days in Rome. He will wear out, he will persecute, he'll wear out the saints of the Most High. I don't know if you've ever read very much about the Nazi concentration camps, but they give us a glimpse and maybe an understanding of this term, wear out. Uh, there are stories of starvation in those concentration camps, and people walking naked in the snow without clothing, gruesome, bat-breaking work in the factories. And we're told that many, uh, many of those precious people just went, went crazy uh, with, with what they went through. And they would run and, and be shot uh, by the guards, or they would run and they would uh, attach themselves to the fence, trying to climb over the fence and, and of course, meet immediate electrocution. Well, that's the idea, exactly what took place in those Nazi concentration camps. They're just, you know, Satan will wear these people out. It will not be an immediate death, but it will be long and tedious and torturous. So the slaughterer of the saints. He also, strangely enough, for a period of time, a short period of time, will be a hero to the Hebrews. A hero to the Hebrews. Uh, for three and a half years, they will think that this is the Messiah. It will be at a time when, you know, that they'll be looking for peace. And listen, they've always been looking for peace in the Middle East. You know, they say, the Bible says they'll say, peace, peace, but there is no peace. And all of a sudden, this one will arrive on the scene, and he'll say, I can do it. I can bring peace to the Middle East. Uh, and they will think, this is the guy. For three and a half years, they'll think, this is, this is our man. This is our Messiah. You know, Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name, and you've received me not. Another will come in his own name. Him you will receive. Talking about, 
talking about the Antichrist, John chapter 5 and verse 43. At the midpoint of the tribulation, after the first three and a half years of the tribulation, when they're thinking, this is our guy, all of a sudden the scales will fall off their eyes, and they'll say, this is not our Messiah. He is a menace to our people. And boy, then the persecution will, will escalate as, as never before, as he begins to ravage God's precious people, the Jews. So the Hebrew, he wrote to the Hebrews, also he'll be a purveyor of perversion. The Antichrist will be a purveyor of perversion. Daniel chapter 11, there's a passage there that uh, a lot of people have found curious. Daniel chapter 11 and verse uh, 37, it says, He shall regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor shall regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. That little phrase, uh, he shall have no regard for the desire of women. Some people felt, well, well that must infer that, he will be, uh, that he'll be a homosexual, uh, that he'll be a pervert. Well, that's very likely. That's very likely because one thing Satan does is, is, he, is he rents God's truth. He rebels against God's, uh, God's word. And God has set up structure in the home, a man and a woman, a male and a female, so it would not be a stretch at all to see this guy as being a homosexual, a sodomite. Uh, homosexuality is called an abomination in Scripture because it lists a fist against God's created order. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 it says, He'll intend to change times and the law. He's going to turn away from, from God's law and establish his, his own law with degrading human practices. So he'll be a purveyor of perversion. Also, he'll defy death. He'll defy death. In Revelation uh, chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 3, John writes, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, talking about the Antichrist, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. And now he's using imagery here, and he's talking about a beast that rises up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. It's talking about his, his knowledge, his power, his rulership, and, uh, and he's wounded, mortally wounded. And what this is, is a mimicking of the resurrection of our Lord. Uh, this uh, Antichrist somehow received some type of, of, of uh, uh, deathly wound. And miraculously, he will, he will heal from this, uh, from this wound. I don't know if you remember many, many years ago when Ronald Reagan was shot. And many people said, oh, you know, he's recovered from a mortal wound. Well, it wasn't a mortal wound. But they said, oh, he's the Antichrist. A lot of people, <laughs> because uh, uh, Reagan's name was Ronald Wilson Reagan. And there's six letters to each of the three names. Said, oh, that's the Antichrist. Listen, I don't, I don't know what you feel about that. I think Ronald Reagan was a wonderful president. But there's some people that I remember back when that happened uh, said, oh, this is, this is akin to what it says in Scripture. Oh, not at all. Not at all. Uh, but the Antichrist will defy death. And because of that, the masses will marvel and follow this beast. Again, there are miracle mongers out there. And, oh, if you do a miracle, uh, you got him. You got him. Also, he'll be a military monarch and a political powerhouse. Uh, going to Revelation 13 and verse 1, John says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, you know, Speaks of knowledge, complete knowledge, the perfect number. And ten horns, horns were symbol of power. And on his horns, ten crowns, and on his head, blasphemous names. So here's one rising up out of the sea. You say, my goodness, uh, that's, that's a hideous picture. Well, actually, Revelation 17 and verse 15 interprets this for us and says that the sea uh, simply means the mass of people. He'll come from the masses of of people. And the idea is he'll rise without fanfare. That he'll rise without a lot of fanfare. Um, I think about the book of Jude, and Jude talks about uh, false teachers entering into the church, and he says that they crept in unawares. That is, they just kind of slip in very quietly, and before you know it, they've taken over. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8, it refers to the Antichrist as a little horn that rises where three horns have been uprooted. So he appears first as just a little horn where three other horns have been uprooted. He, he rises up 
And before you know it, he has great, great authority through, through his political shrewdness and through his military takeover. You can read in the book of Daniel and also Revelation, it talks about that. Also, he'll be a servant of Satan. Surprise, surprise. Uh, he'll be Satan incarnate in Revelation 13 and verse 2. Now, the second part, it says, The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And if you read in Revelation, you'll find out that the uh, dragon is uh, interpreted uh, in chapter 12 of Revelation as none other than, uh, than, than Satan or, or the devil in uh, Revelation 12 and verse number 9. So uh, this person uh, will be Satan incarnate. Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Uh, the Antichrist will be able to say that too. The Antichrist will be able to say, He who has seen me has seen my Father. His Father will be, will be Satan himself. And you know, when you think of, of the Antichrist, you think of Judas, who was one who sold out Jesus Christ after following him for three years. And nobody was the wiser. You know, when Jesus said, I tell you, one of you will betray me, they didn't say, well, I, I bet it's Judas. They didn't have a clue because he was so shrewd and he was so, so uh, uh, secretive with his evil. So this guy, the Antichrist, will be a servant of Satan. Also, he'll have a, a sinister sidekick, a sinister sidekick. And uh, Revelation 13, go down to verse 11, and it says... <clears throat> Then I saw another beast uh, coming up from the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. How about that? Like a lamb. And spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell on it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Uh, so we have Satan, the dragon, the beast, the Antichrist, and now here's the false prophet, this second beast. Uh, what you have here is the unholy trinity. The unholy trinity. The dragon, the antichrist, and the false prophet. Uh, just as there's the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. Satan has always tried to mimic God. And this, uh, this false prophet will bring down fire from heaven, much like Elijah. <laughs> you know, uh, John the Baptist was in the power of Elijah and the forerunner of Christ. Well, here the false prophet is the beast, sinister minister of propaganda. And basically he has two jobs. He has two jobs. Did you see what they were? Number one, he'll be a worker of worship in verse 12. That he'll cause those who dwell on the earth to worship the first beast. And here's what Satan has always desired. This prof false prophet will merge all the world religions into a world church. And you can read further in Revelation about that, but that is, that is uh, his, his agenda for a one world religion to arise. And folks, I'll tell you what, uh, uh, we're seeing that today. Uh, we're seeing that today. If you've read any uh, of the things that the, the Pope has said recently as he, he meets with Muslim leaders, he is trying desperately to, to, to merge with the Islamic world. Uh, oh, listen, folks. Uh, that, that's right out of the pit of hell. And that is playing right into the agenda of uh, the beast and the false prophet. Uh, if you continue to read, you'll find out that this false prophet makes an image, and he sets this image up. This image will be of the beast, the Antichrist, and he'll be able to somehow manipulate that, uh, that image to speak. And people will, oh, what a miracle. And and they'll bow down and they'll worship. So he'll be a worker of worship. Also, he'll be a controller of commerce. A controller of commerce. Again, Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18. He causes all. Don't miss that. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on, better translation in the Greek, in and to, their right hand and on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it's the number of a man, that is, man was created on the sixth day, and his number is 666. And the triad, the three, is man in place of God. And that's what the, what the Antichrist will be. He'll be a controller of commerce. Uh, you have to receive this mark in two, in two, uh, the skin, and uh, you know, 
know, years ago, <laughs> you know, what, you would have looked, what, what's it talking about? Uh, 60, 70, 80 years ago, you, you wouldn't have understood what this meant. But folks, we well understand today as they are working with microchips that a microchip can be implanted easily uh, under the skin and uh, can uh, track a person, and can have all their health information. We see Bill Gates has proposed ID 2020 of um, you know, what he wants to do is to identify every person on the planet. And uh, folks, what would happen if you, uh, during this pandemic, hear word that now we have an inoculation. You need to go to the inoculation center, and as they're giving you this inoculation, they're going to also implant a small chip uh, the size of a piece of rice. And uh, this will have all your information on it. You won't be able to buy, sell, or trade unless you have this chip. Um, well... You know, it's going to happen during the days of tribulation. The church won't be here, praise God. But uh, if you're here, you'll have to make that decision. Uh, his sinister sidekick, a worker of worship, a controller of commerce. Also getting back to the Antichrist, he's a, he's a man of mystery. You know, people ask, will he be a Jew? Will he be a Gentile? Well, some believe, uh, based on Revelation 13 and verse 1, that he'll be a Gentile. That he'll come out of the sea, the masses of people. And uh, some say, well, well how... Uh, would the Jews receive a, a non-Jew as their Savior? Well, if you go on the Internet, you can read what they say about Donald Trump. And Donald Trump has been very good to the Jewish people, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, but they're calling Donald Trump, who's a Gentile, uh, the king of Israel. Uh, they're calling him a friend of the Jewish people. And uh, they have many synonyms, many words for Donald Trump of great and high praise. Uh, will he be a Gentile? I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I think based on, on Daniel chapter 11 and uh, verse 37, I, I think he will be a Jew. It says there, He shall uh, regard neither the God of his fathers. He shall have neither regard for the God of his fathers. And personally, I believe that's an indication that he will be, he'll be Jewish. I, I truly don't believe that Jewish people receive their Messiah except he be, except he be a Jew. So a man of mystery. And then lastly... Uh, he has a date with destiny. And I'm going to have to move fast because I think my time is running out. <laughs> so <laughs> turn over to Revelation 19. And uh, if you look at verse uh, 20 with me, it says, Then the beast was captured, and within the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped the beast or his image. Uh, these two were cast alive into the lake uh, a fire burning with brimstone. Uh, so we see that he has a date with destiny, and uh, the beast and the false prophet will be cast in the lake of fire. And also in Revelation 20 and verse 2, it tells us that he laid hold of the dragon, that is Satan, the serpent of old, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So all of a sudden there will be an end to evil, and guess what's going to happen? The millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ. You prayed for it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're going to talk about the millennial kingdom. I, I know talking about the, the tribulation has been horribly depressing. It, it's not a, not, a good, uh, not a good thing at all, but praise God the church won't be here. If you're redeemed, if you're a child of God, the Bible indicates that God will not pour His wrath out on His people. Uh, but uh, once we talk about the millennial kingdom, oh, what a change. As Jesus Christ will rule from the throne of David. That's what we're going to talk about next time. I'm glad you're with us. Let's pray very quickly. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for grace and thank you for mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the salvation through your blood. And I pray that many that hear today may turn to you in faith. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.